Psalm 139 verses 1 to 18 You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. So that's David praising God, worshipping him. Beautiful, isn't it? Just David recounting some of the breathtaking attributes of his heavenly father, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. That is his all-knowing, all-encompassing, all-powerful nature. Incredible stuff. You can feel his excitement as you read through what he says. It takes a bit of a nosedive, though, in the next line. After all this wonderful praise, after extolling the greatness of all those amazing attributes of his heavenly father, David immediately comes out with this. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Hmm. Now, to be fair to the man, he hates them because they hate God. They are in rebellion against God, and David would rather like to see them die for it. And occasionally God has indeed slayed, slain the wicked, notably in the Old Testament and even a couple in the New. But those who God has killed for wickedness are statistically negligible, obviously, because we all sin, and yet there is still a human race. David himself engaged in wickedness. He impregnated Uriah the Hittite's wife Bathsheba and then had Uriah murdered. And Uriah was a, a loyal follower of David whose only real crime was to refuse to go home and sleep with his wife when David wanted to cover his tracks because Uriah thought it wrong to sleep in his own bed while all the men under his command were roughing him. And yet, David the adulterer, David the murderer, was known as a man after God's own heart. How so? Well, I think it's to do with how well David knew God. And we see this in the aftermath of the Bathsheba incident. There's no sacrifice for adultery and murder. What David has done is beyond the pale. No remedy, no way back under the law. But in Psalm 51, David says this, Have mercy on me, 
oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David is appealing for grace and mercy. The law can't help him. It utterly condemns him. But he is going above that. He's appealing directly to the lawgiver. And God gives him both grace and mercy. He somehow knew there was more to God than the rule book, that there was this glorious grace, and there still is. But think about that for a moment. David lived at a time before the cross of Christ, the time when the rule of God's law was absolute. His transgressions put him literally beyond redemption. And yet his relationship with God is so deep, he knows he can call on God's unfailing love and his great compassion. He's asking God to wash away all his iniquity and cleanse him from sin. That's a function we associate with the blood of Jesus, isn't it? But here we have this Old Testament character pleading for exactly that. This is a man who knows God in a way which goes beyond the law and the prophets. And perhaps we also see his deep relationship with God in another incident. When David danced before the Lord to celebrate the return of the Ark of the Covenant, 2 Samuel 6 takes up the story. It says, wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. As the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. His wife was not best pleased. Michal said to him, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. But David replied, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. What does that tell us? It tells us that David loved God so much that he rejoiced in him so much he didn't care what anyone thought. He was celebrating God. A God, incidentally, that cares only where the heart is. A God who's not interested in decorum or propriety, but delights in worship from the heart. A God who is not bothered if David is prancing around with his meat and two veg hanging out because he's leaping and dancing for joy in the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart. He knew him in a way that most people don't. And he loved him in a way that few others do, despite his failings and his sin. He aligned himself fully with God. He was on God's side. And we know from the reading that those who made themselves enemies of God also made enemies of David. He says, if only you, God, would slay those wicked. But we first see this commitment to God in the Goliath episode, when he was just a young lad. Before killing that Philistine, he has this to say, he says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So God's enemies are David's enemies. He always remained faithful to God. His relationship with God didn't 
preclude tough times. He was hunted by Saul, wasn't he? He was outnumbered by his enemies. He got hungry and thirsty and tired. His faithfulness didn't depend on God giving him an easy ride. Like Job before him, he stuck with God through thick and thin. He was obedient. As 2 Samuel 5 tells us, he did what the Lord commanded him. To the man or woman after God's own heart, obedience is a standard prerequisite. It's never negotiable, never optional, and certainly never dependent on favourable circumstances. One of the reasons that David wanted God to slay the wicked was their rebellion against God, their disobedience. Now, David had a sensational life. He was a mighty warrior and later became king of Israel. But his life wasn't looking too promising to begin with, though. Just a, a kid in charge of some sheep. But God had plans for him. He didn't become a man after God's own heart because of what God did with his life, though. We see that in the Goliath incident. He was already that man while he was still tending the flock. A man who would gladly fight to the death for the honour of God, no matter what the odds. What set David apart was the quality of his faith. It's one thing to believe in God. A lot of people do that. But it's quite another trust in him completely and really know who he is in your heart. David did both those things. He knew who God was. He knew his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. Not as head knowledge, though, but as something which provoked him to praise and worship. Psalm 139 is a celebration of God's nature. It's not just a, a list of his attributes. Real faith and real love will always be expressed in praise and worship. We see that again in the dancing episode, don't we? David is celebrating God. He's celebrating God's victory over the Philistines and the return of the Ark of the Covenant. God's victory, not David's victory. Heartfelt celebration never cares about decorum or propriety. Think about this for a moment. You ever see the fuss they make over an Olympic gold medal sprinter? The celebrations, the, the gushing praise. So, some guy has managed to travel 100 metres and he's made his legs go two hundredth of a second faster than some other guys. And that is cause for rejoicing. And on the other hand, we have God creator of life, the universe and everything, saviour of the world, the one who offers us joy eternal. And once a week, we sing to him. Does that seem right to you? David's response to God might have outraged his wife, but my thought on his behaviour is simply this. Why did he wait for the return of the ark to celebrate God like that? Compared to what else God has already done, it's not such a big deal, is it? Any real understanding of who God is and what is accomplished should prompt constant praise and worship with or without decorum. Real faith always produces faithfulness and true faithfulness is always independent of circumstances. It doesn't matter what's going on, the man or woman after God's own heart remains faithful. And real faith always produces obedience. David was consistently obedient to God, with the notable exception of the Uriah incident. And what a tragedy that was. A tragedy for Uriah, of course. But there was also the loss of Bathsheba's and David's baby. Nonetheless, we see God's grace and mercy at work with no way back, no sacrifice to be made to atone for his sin. David offers one anyway. In Psalm 
51 verse 17, we read this. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And of course, it is accepted. Heartfelt repentance, an appeal for grace, and God has mercy. It's beautiful. Yeah, he disobeyed God, but God is bigger than David's sin, and he's bigger than ours. David understood God's compassion and his willingness to forgive. He didn't just know the law, he knew the lawgiver. Now, I hope you find these reflections on David inspiring, and I, I do hope you realise that there is nothing to stop you becoming a man or woman after God's own heart. All that David did was to act on his faith. Simple as that. He believed God, he trusted God, and his actions were consistent with that. He engaged in deep praise and worship. He was faithful and obedient. Okay, so you and me, we're not going to get to be king over Israel. But if we're in that place, if we're after God's own heart, he can entrust any service to us. We don't get to kill Goliath, but we'll slay whatever giants cast their shadows over our lives. And most importantly, we'll be connecting with God at the deepest level where we know his character and where we rejoice in it, where our praise and worship is the overflow of a grateful heart. David's life, for me at least, was not really about his achievements. He did a lot of stuff, sure, but that was merely a function of his relationship with God. I would be over the moon to have that depth of relationship with or without the high profile stuff. I think it's pursuing, it's worth pursuing with everything I've got. So what about you? May we pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the life and example of David. Not so much for, for what he achieved, Lord, but for what he became a man after your own heart. I pray for myself and for any like-minded people here today that you will give us every assistance in getting as close to you as he was. And Father, crown all our efforts to be fully open to you with success. In Jesus' name.